Good morning. Welcome to worship. My name is Thomas. I serve on the pastoral staff, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you as we gather together in the presence of God to give thanks and to worship. And uh, as we do so today, I want to mention that uh, in your pew racks, you will find a set of cards, and uh, you are welcome to look through those. If you have prayer requests to share, there is a prayer card. If there are other things you want to know about the church, you can find them there. So just feel free to check those out, and there's even a kid's card for the little ones. And we are so glad that all of you are here, whether you are worshiping in person or worshiping with us online, we are delighted to be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In that spirit, I invite you to join in our opening to him, our gathering him, which is number 327. Crown him with many crowns. Let us rise in body or spirit and praise God together. Now let's join together in our opening liturgy. We gather as wanderers, sojourners, and adventurers, living into the unknown together. Meet us, O God, on our journeys. Guide us, O Spirit, as you awaken us. Amen. Well, now let's uh, greet those who are worshiping online. Uh, we are so glad uh, that you are with us. And let's greet one another.
You may be seated. Now I invite you to join me in a spirit of prayer. Amazing God, we come into your presence with singing this morning, grateful for your mercies, grateful for the opportunity to be together in your presence. Oh God, we do pray that you will open our eyes and our ears and our hearts, that we may understand your love more deeply, that we may understand this wonderful mystery of the resurrection, not only in our minds, but in our hearts. Oh Lord, we are so thankful for your gracious presence throughout all our experiences. And we are so thankful that you sent your son to us. He has lived our life, he understands all that we go through, Lord. And so we thank you that we are not alone. You are with us even in those times when we have questions or doubts. Oh God, you don't condemn us when we question you. You are patient when you doubt, when we doubt your promises. Thank you. Thank you for that loving kindness and that patience with us. You walk with us through all the ups and downs, through all our anxieties and fears, our frustrations and our deferred hopes. Through it all, you are faithful, and we praise you for that faithfulness. Please guide us on the path to deeper faith in you, O oh Lord. Guide us to a deeper understanding of your love and your promises. Help us to trust you in the midst of changes and heartbreaks. Above all, to trust you. And most of all, Lord, help us to turn to you for all our needs, to call upon you for everything we need. In that spirit, we pause now to lift our prayers to you in silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. O oh Lord, so many of our friends and loved ones right now need breakthrough. They need your resurrection power. And so we pray for them this morning that you will do what only you can do. That is our prayer. In a world, Lord, where there is so much chaos and war and violence, we pray today for peace. Oh, Lord, sometimes we don't know how to pray. In the midst of all of the, the news, we pray for peace, Lord, and we trust that you are at work. And we pray, Lord, for our leaders, that you will give them wisdom in the face of everything 
that is going on. And today, Lord, we pray for the Ecuador mission team. Please bless them with a safe and fruitful trip and uh, bless the work they're doing with the mission teams, the worship teams from churches all around the nation of Ecuador that this work may bring vitality, renewed vitality in the churches of Ecuador. Lord, we lift up all of our prayers to you, both our spoken and unspoken prayers. In the mighty name of the risen Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I invite you to take a quick look at your Sunday connections and uh, see what's coming up on the horizon. First of all, as I mentioned last week, The United Women in Faith are having a Spring Saddle Luncheon coming up on Saturday, April 27th at 11.30 a.m. The information is in there for you, and no pre-registration is required. Second, let me remind you, Vacation Bible School is coming up June 3 through 7, and this is a big time in the life of our church and community, and if you would would like to register a child or a grandchild, there are still spaces open. And of course, now we are looking for volunteers who love to work with kids and share the good news and bless them that week. And uh, you can use that link to register as a volunteer as well. Also, our church is hosting four day camps this summer uh, for older children. And uh, we still have plenty of openings in three of those camps. Mystery Week, Let's Get Messy Week, and Art Week. So if any of those sound like fun to to a youngster that you know, uh, please uh, tell them about it. This is not restricted to members of the church. In fact, the majority of the people who attend our summer day camps uh, are actually from the wider community. So if you know somebody you think would benefit, please spread the word. Let them know about these camps. Finally, I want to preview community time for the next two Sundays. Next week, April 22nd, Pastor Don and I will be offering a time of Holy Communion and prayer in the chapel. And we invite you to join us next Sunday, 1030. On April 28th, also at 1030 a.m., Pastor Don and Christine Vallon will be telling about their experience in India on the Global Hope mission trip that they they led. And so if you would like to hear about that mission in India, see some photos and uh, learn all about it, uh, please join them in two weeks for our community time in the chapel. And thank you all for all that you do to serve. God bless you.
Thank you, Grace Notes, always beautiful, and what a wonderful reminder for all of us as we gather of that hymn of promise, that there is hope that is in everything, in everything we do, it's all around us, and so thank you, Grace Notes, for reminding us of that. Well, good morning. Good, good to see all of you this morning. For those of you who may be guests with us today, just introduce myself. My name is Pastor Don. And I am part of the pastoral team here at Broomfield UMC. And just always consider it a joy to be in worship with you, to be in community with you, uh, to listen to music with you. Uh, it's always a joy to come together. I've got a quick question for you. Do any of you have a nickname? A show of hands. Any kind of nicknames? Okay. And now are you willing to share your nickname? Or maybe, maybe if you don't want to share, maybe there's like a, a fun nickname of a friend or a, a sibling that you would like, you would rather share today. I mean, what, what are some nicknames that are out in the congregation? Yeah. Lady Cliffhanger. All right. There's a story behind that one. Yeah. <laughs> other, other nicknames. What is it? Hoss. I can see that. <laughs> All right. Others, yeah. Tuffy. I can see that too. <laughs> That's just somebody else. Not you, huh? Okay, who else? Boss lady. All right. Yep. Grandma Jamma. I like that. Grandma Jamma. Yeah. Memer Lemer. <laughs> I like that too. All right. Any others? Yeah. Ambrose. What's that? Ripples. All right. You have to tell me that story a little bit later. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to have to hear it again. Velix and Viggy. Okay. All right. So that's a couple's nickname. Yeah. All right. Good. Well, I have some nicknames myself. Uh, some of them I have grown up with uh, throughout my lifetime. Some of them, you know, are just during certain seasons. So the one that I've grown up with my lifetime is actually just an extension of my name, and that is Donnie. And I just want to be clear that only my family calls me Donnie. <laughs> Make sure that that's very, very clear. I know there's always somebody at the end of every worship service that comes out and has to say my name that way. Um, but Donnie is, is the big one. Uh, but also, when I was younger, uh, people would call me sometimes Donald Duck. That was done more in making fun of me than anything else. A play not only on my first name, but also my last name. When I was in high school and also in college, my buddies would call me Birdman. Uh, when my sister and I, my older sister and I, whenever we would kind of be together and we were among other friends, they would actually call us Donnie and Marie. I hated that. Uh, my, my sister's name is Lisa, by the way, but I hated that. And my mom, I don't know if anybody else's mom out there had a special nickname for them. My mom had a special nickname for me. I have never shared this in any other church ever. And I just, this is a safe place. I feel like I can share this with you. My mom called me Mr. Nobut. That was my name. And she had a very special song that she made up to go with that nickname. So much so that when I actually I got older, mainly when I was a teenager, I didn't want to do something that she wanted me to do. Especially if I was in a group of friends, she'd say, I'm going to start singing the song. I'm going to start singing your special song. And of course, I would do it, right? We all have probably on some level or another nicknames or, or names that people have called us, whether they're names that, that make us feel good and sometimes they're names that don't make us feel good. Names and labels, they are, they are very powerful, powerful things. And as it turns out, especially for those names that we don't like, old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, not very accurate in our lives. At least for some of the nicknames that I've been given, especially the one from my mom. Maybe it should sound more like sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can cut me to the core in a way where I need years of therapy. <laughs> nicknames. They're not always welcomed in our lives. Some are short-lived. Some stay with us whether we like them or not. And I think that's actually what's happened to one of Jesus' disciples by the name of Thomas. You all know Thomas's nickname? 
what is Thomas's nickname? Doubting Thomas. That nickname labeled him for all of eternity because of one moment in his life. And that moment in his life was captured in the Gospel of John. And I'm going to be reading for you from chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. And this is through the CEB translation. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't, the disi- wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing, you will have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I actually think poor Thomas gets a bad rap. (laughs) That was not planned. He did that first service too, but that was not a planned thing. I figured he would probably do something like that. For those of you who are worshiping with online, Pastor Thomas said amen to that. So I mean, he was obviously doing something else, at least in our scripture. He was doing something else when, when the risen Jesus appeared to the disciples for the first time. And our, and our story tells us that, that he didn't believe what his best friends were telling him, that, that they had actually seen Jesus alive. But I think it's a bit unkind that he actually goes down in history by being labeled and given the nickname of Doubting Thomas. I mean, in one sense, it's accurate, right? I mean, he did doubt that Jesus had risen, but he did something about his doubt. He was honest about his doubts. He said he needed proof. He needed to actually see Jesus. He needed to, to touch his wounds in order to believe in the resurrection. And did you notice that even in the midst of all this, he actually stayed with his friends, the the disciples. He didn't didn't walk out. He didn't say that they were all crazy for, for believing such a ludicrous thing. And the disciples themselves didn't kick him out for not believing what they believed. And that alone, I think, should speak volumes for us today. Kind of like a second Easter miracle, if you will that they stayed connected even when they didn't see eye to eye. I don't know about you, but that seems harder to believe than the actual resurrection itself, especially in light of how our world is going today. But it gets even better, and I don't know if you caught it or not, but but oftentimes when we read this particular passage, or at least as I have in the past, it, it kind of feels like it's all wrapped up into one day. But, but actually that's not what's going on because it didn't happen all in one day. Because eight days later, they're still all together holding the tensions of their questions and their doubts and their different beliefs. And Jesus comes and he appears to them again. He says, peace be with you. And then he goes straight to Thomas, not to berate him for doubting, but to invite him to look at and touch his wounds. Thomas, who had been doubting Thomas for one week, makes a profession of faith as he kneels before Jesus and as he exclaims, my Lord and my God. One of the most powerful statements of faith that we find throughout the Gospels. And one I believe that's worthy to be remembered for rather than the doubts. This story alone is a powerful reminder, a powerful encouragement for the church if we dare to hear it. Because I believe that it reminds us in in some ways, it encourages us to, to be more gracious, more generous, more accepting as we are made up 
of different people with different experiences, different understandings of Jesus, of God, of the church. We're blessed with people who have deep faith. We're blessed with people who with emerging, doubting, questioning faith and everything in between. And if we're really being honest, we often find ourselves moving back and forth along that spectrum throughout our lives, don't we? I think the low-hanging fruit of the message of this story reminds us of the importance of honesty in our faith. Honesty in our doubt. See, Jesus does not condemn Thomas for doubting. He actually responds directly to his doubt. I believe the doubt and lack of faith, they don't take us away from God. They're part of the spiritual journey with faith. And what can take us actually away from God is to have doubts and questions, but to do nothing about them. Or on the flip side, to fix our beliefs so firmly in certainty that we close down any possibility of learning more or from seeing from another perspective. If the story of Thomas teaches us anything, it's that faith and doubt can and must live together on our spiritual journeys. But I think the lesson of this story actually goes even much deeper than that. Yes, I believe it is good to be reminded that faith and doubt must live together because religion has done enough damage in the name of Jesus to people who doubt or to people who question. It oftentimes makes me cringe when I hear people respond to skeptics and questioners and and the curious with, well, you just have to have faith. Well, you just need to believe. Quite frankly, friends, all that tells me is that quite possibly maybe you haven't thought it through enough yourself. And that maybe any kind of questioning scares you because it may break the fragile faith you already possess. There has to be more, I believe, to this story than just saying we believe than just saying, I believe in God or Jesus or the resurrection. Because in my experience, believing and the trouble with believing in stuff is that belief can actually make no difference whatsoever. I mean, think about it. I can believe in justice for all, but until I am prepared to seek justice, to be fair, to resist injustice, it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever what I believe. We can all stay here and shout, Christ is risen, until we have no more breath. All that we want, unless we are willing to live the resurrection, all of that means very little at all. And I wonder if that's really the point of our gospel writer, John. And I wonder if that's the point that he's trying to make right at the very end when he says that believing you will have life in his name. That if we truly want to live the resurrection, we need to begin practicing resurrection. Because I believe it's long past time for us to move beyond believing in resurrection so that we can actually rise up as people of resurrection. Whatever season of life and faith that we are in, no matter the doubts and the questions and uncertainties about where we are going or what we believe, no matter the the certainties that ground us and the curiosities that free us, can we hear Jesus calling us to practice resurrection? I think that term practice, in this case, to me, it actually means more like opportunity. That we take a look at each day and say, today I get to be a participant in resurrection. I have that opportunity to participate in resurrection. And if I am participating, then that means that a piece of humanity is participating. And if through me, humanity is participating then that means that a little piece of the world is being made whole. That phrase, practice resurrection, it whispers not just for me, not just for you, but for a world that desperately needs it. 
Wendell Berry has a poem called Mad Farmer's Liberation Manifesto. And it's actually about living a simple life that's connected to the land. And he talks about doing what is right. He talks about doing what will last into the future, a future that we can't see and we won't see. He talks about caring for people beyond politics and, and living into the mystery of life. And he sums all of it up, all of the very facets of living with his final line when he says, practice resurrection. Live well, live intentionally, live for others as well as yourself. Throughout the poem, he's inviting us to practice resurrection. All that is part of resurrection. So here we sit in the Easter season, this part of the church year where more than ever we focus on the resurrection of Jesus. And right in the middle of all of the gathering darkness, all of the growing divisiveness in our country, the mounting fear, the violence around the world, in the midst of all the need and the hurt and the turmoil, right in the midst of all of this, we arrive at Easter when Christ emerged from the tomb and conquered death. And it's fitting, really. And it's forced me to think even more about what it means to, to practice resurrection how I can live into the resurrection of Christ in our current world and in what ways that, that I can help our world inch its way to wholeness. My family will tell you that I am one of those people that when I go somewhere like a zoo, museums, whatever, I am one of those people that stands there and reads every little thing. And as I'm standing there and reading every little thing, especially at museums, I then start to envision what it meet, might be like to actually live in that time or live in that space or what was going on for those particular people there. Well, I kind of do that as well when it comes to Easter. And there are times I begin by imagining what it's like to be in the tomb and, and seeing the, the daylight shining through the opening where the stone has been rolled away. And, and, and I can imagine Jesus coming down into the tomb with me and, and, and putting his arms around me and lifting me up on my feet slowly and gently. And then we begin to move toward the light, toward all that fresh air, toward new life. Because when Jesus enters the picture, it's always a new beginning. And that's resurrection. And as I think about that and as I reflect on that just for myself, I sometimes begin to wonder, well, what does that look like in our world? What does that look like for, for all of us on a daily basis to, to experience resurrection, to, to practice resurrection? And sometimes maybe it's just... Resurrection looks like having the courage to just stand up in the midst of the darkness. Maybe it's having courage just to get out of bed. And sometimes it's, it's maybe answering the phone and, and talking to the person that you just really don't want to talk to. Or perhaps it's even lighter. Maybe it's just stretching your legs. Maybe it's going for a walk. Maybe it's, it's picking up that paintbrush that has been sitting there waiting for you to come back to it. Or maybe it's... It's living that dream that has been on the shelf of your heart for such a long time. I mean, maybe resurrection is, is letting go. Maybe it's accepting the fact that we can't control things and there, aren't th there are some things that we just can't fix. And maybe resurrection is a, is a nap. Maybe it's a, a smile. Maybe it's freshly baked brownies left on the doorstep of a neighbor's home. And all of this practicing resurrection is the act of reaching toward anything that will give you life. And in a world that is being smothered by death and hopelessness, that reaching toward life, friends, it's revolutionary. It's defiant. And that's the point. See, Thomas reached for life 
He reached for resurrection when he touched the wounds of Jesus. And in that moment, his heart and his soul were opened, opened in such a way that, that, that something miraculous happened. Something happened to Thomas. Something happened to all the other disciples who had been huddled together there in fear that gave them the strength to burst forth from their tombs and to go and change the world. Ever since they began to practice resurrection, people have been trying to figure out exactly what may have happened. I mean, really, what, what could have changed these, these bumbling, terrified betrayers and abandoners who seem to always get things wrong? What could have changed them into a bunch of leaders who began a movement that spread throughout the empire just under the power of their own witness? And under that power of their own witness, that movement began to spread throughout the world. And it continues to flourish and nourish and inspire and sustain millions of people from generation to generation to generation to generation. No matter their doubts, their fears, their uncertainties, their lack. When they wondered where to, I wonder if they could then hear Jesus calling them to practice resurrection right where they were. And can we hear God, can we hear Jesus calling us to do the same? A week from tomorrow, Monday, April 22nd, it actually commemorates the 54th anniversary of Earth Day. That's just another reminder for us to choose life in the midst of these trying times. And I, I share that because Wendell Berry's poem, in it he urges us to do what he calls plant sequoias. Now, as you know, sequoias are the giant redwood trees, you know, those ones that can, that can grow up to 26 stories, that they can live anywhere between 1,800 and 2,700 years. Why would he say that? That to plant a sequoia is actually to acknowledge the fact that you're never going to see it grow to its full height. You're never going to be able to see the effects that planting that tree will have on an ecosystem and everything else around it. To plant that tree is to believe in the future generations that will come after you. To plant a sequoia is actually choosing life. And it's paving the way for others to do the same. Practicing resurrection, it's never about you and me. It's about all of us. Because resurrection says that life is a cycle. And in order to have resurrection, you have to enter into that cycle. You have to have life, death, and then you have to live again. And when we go through that cycle, grief is a part of that process. Hardship is a part of that process. Nostalgia and memories are part of the process. And when we take all of that with us as we come out of the tomb, we take with us those memories, just like the scars on Jesus' hands and side and feet. And life moves forward, and it will always find a way. And Christ is with us as we choose life, helping us to walk out of our tombs, whatever those tombs may look like, to choose life, to choose to walk the journey toward wholeness. And we're given that opportunity every single day. And I don't know about you, but it's hard to think of anything else our world needs more of right now. And as we practice resurrection, as we live into that call from Jesus, maybe then we'll be given new nicknames. Love bombers. No, that's not very good. Light bearers, life bringers, names that are different than the names that the Christian church has today. Names that maybe we won't be embarrassed by, but names that will be, make an impact throughout all of eternity. Will you please join me in our unison prayer?
when everything was dark and it seemed that the sun would never shine. Your love broke through. Your love was too strong, too wide, too deep for death to hold. The sparks cast by your love dance and spread and burst forth with resurrection light. Loving God, we praise you for the light of new life we discover in Jesus. We praise you for the light of new life that shone on the first witnesses of resurrection. We praise you for the light of new life that continues to shine in our hearts today. We pray that the Easter light of life, hope, and joy will live in each, each day and that we will be bearers of that light into the lives of others as we practice resurrection. Amen. Amen. As we come to this time of, of giving and receiving of our tithes and offerings, we want to share with you just a, a little bit about how your giving is encouraging us to continue to be in ministry. And how your giving is helping also to support a, a group that we have here at our church that's the Senior Adult Ministry. Or what do you call them, Thomas? Good Sam. Good Sam Ministry. Uh, we have a group of dedicated volunteers who, who assist seniors and disabled adults in our church and our community with basic needs. Such as minor home maintenance, transportation to medical appointments, tech assistance, occasional respite care, whatever those needs might be. And this team reflects our faith, communi faith community's caring spirit. And we're grateful for all the ways in which they give and they serve. This team helps people stay in their homes safely. And your generosity of time and financial gifts makes ministry like this possible. I also would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to uh, also mention, I know she's, she's not aware that this is going to happen right now, but Tracy Cullen is in the back. And Tracy has been a longtime person of, of coordinating our Wheels to Worship, which brings people to worship at our 1115 worship service every Sunday. And she does it mainly from Boston, where she lives. That's her commitment. And I, we are so grateful for you. And so every time we get a chance to see you, whenever you make it back to Colorado, we love you. We appreciate the ways in which you serve. Let's thank uh, Tracy as well for her service. To me, this just shows the generosity of spirit, the generous spirit of the people who call Bloomfield UMC home. Thank you so much for the many ways and all the ways you give. May God add his blessings to the giving and receiving of our gifts this morning. Amen.
invite you to remain standing as you are able as we sing our closing hymn, which is hymn number 307, Christ is Risen. Amen. And before the benediction, I want to invite those who are going to be partnering with us here at Broomfield UMC to go ahead and come forward. The families that are going to be there we go, the Augusts and the Patricas. And uh, there's Gail. All right. Come on up. Come on up. I'll also have you guys walk all the way down over here. There we go. And just uh, to remind all of us, uh, partnership and what it means. Um, we talk about partnership. Others talk, talk about membership. We actually talk about partnership because we believe that, that we are called to walk with each other in all of the places and spaces that life offers. And so as we partner with one another, we lift each other up, we encourage one another, we love each other on the way of our spiritual journeys and our faith journeys. And so these individuals, along with four others, four uh, others that uh, also partner with us at the, at the early service, so these individuals have decided to, to partner with us here at Broomfield UMC. So I want to introduce them, Don and Alice August, and then we have Jesse and Jaylene Patrika, along with Alara and Ambrose and Leif, is right on over here taking pictures. And then we have Gail Beek as well. And we are so blessed that they have, uh, they, they've already been involved in many different ways, but we're so blessed that they have decided to partner with us in this way as, as new partners here at Broomfield UMC. So now I ask you the Methodist question. Will you partner with Broomfield United Methodist Church and support it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say we will. And now I ask all of you, will you continue to support Broomfield United Methodist Church and partner with us and with our new partners through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say we will. Let's welcome our newest partners here at Broomfield UMC. Now, friends, as we go from here, we have the summit that uh, gives you a little bit more information about everything that's happening in the life and ministry of Broomfield UMC, not only inside of these walls, but also outside of these walls. But as you go from here, go in the power of God, the power of the resurrection, so that you might practice resurrection by reaching towards the things that give you life. Because when you reach toward the things that give you life, it gives life to everyone and everything else around you. Go on God's love, grace, and peace. Amen.